Rad Studio is the IDE of choice for C++ development. Quickly build native, mobile, and desktop applications from a single C++ codebase and deploy to Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. With Rad Studio, user interface design has been made easy with hundreds of pre-built components for cross-platform development. You can easily integrate with popular source control management systems, databases, APIs, and you can make your life easier with numerous third-party extensions. Let Rad Studio do the heavy lifting when it comes to C++ development. Give it a go with a free trial by following the link in the description. Hey, what is going on everybody? Welcome back to your C++ tutorial series. This is, I believe, video number 50, so you're making pretty good progress, but don't quit, there's still a lot more we gotta cover. So what are we gonna be talking about in this video? Well, it's gonna be more on collections, but specifically vectors. So we talked a little bit about vectors when we introduced the concept of collections, but we really just dived into arrays and left vectors kind of unexplained. So that's what we're gonna be doing in this video. This is going to be the concepts of vectors, and then in the next video, we're going to go through some code on how to work with vectors. So what do we need to talk about when it comes to the concepts of vectors? First, what is a vector? Well, first thing, I'm not really entirely sure why it's called a vector. Maybe there's some reason behind that. Other languages often call the equivalent data structure a list or an array list. Very similar to an array in nature, but the difference is that the size is dynamic. And that is the big thing with vectors that you need to understand. So with an array, the size is static. So when you create an array, you put the size inside of square brackets, such as 12, for example, or you assign it something that would allow it to determine the size. So you might assign a sequence of values, and in this case, the size would be 2. With a vector, it doesn't work like that. You create a vector like this. It's in the standard namespace, and then you say vector, and then you use this caret, and then a closing caret, and you can put the type inside of the carrots. So it might look like that, and then you give it a name, like so. And then you can also assign it a sequence of values like that, so you could say 12 and 13. A very common way of working with these is to use a special method that comes with vectors, and that would look like this. So for the items vector, you would say items dot push back. And then inside of parentheses is where you would put that value. So in this case, we're adding the value 100 to the vector. Now, when the vector was first created, there was only two elements in it. One, two. So adding another element might go beyond the memory allocated for this vector. And if that's the situation, whenever you add an element and it goes beyond the memory that's allocated for it, what it's going to do is it's actually going to reallocate memory that's larger and can contain that new element and it's all gonna happen behind the scenes. So it's going to copy the old data and put it in that new allocated memory and it's going to work exactly the same way. From our perspective, nothing has changed, but behind the scenes, it basically expanded how much memory this vector is using. And there's all kinds of different methods you can use with vectors to, to look at how much memory they're using and so forth. But the main thing we want to use is just adding elements and getting those elements back out. So how do we get elements back out of a vector? Exactly the same way as you would with an array. So all you would have to do to grab that 100 is you would say items, and then using array-like syntax, you would just say index two. This is index zero, this is index one, and then this is index two. But you know what else is very awesome when it comes to vectors is they actually know their size. So if you remember when we were working with arrays, we had to calculate their size using the size of operator. Well, we don't gotta do none of that junk anymore. There is a special method attached to items that'll give us the size. So that will look like this. You just say items dot size. So in this case, it's going to return three. One, two, three. Keep in mind, the indexes are always shifted one over, so the indexes are zero, one, and two, whereas the size is one, two, three. So if you want to grab the last element of the vector, what you can do is you could actually say items, and then for the index to pass, what you could do is say items.size minus one. So that is how you can dynamically grab that last element inside of the vector. I'll also briefly show you some of the other methods that are available for vectors because there's a lot more stuff you can do. But if you know how to add elements to it and get those elements back out and calculate the size, 
that's basically all you need to know how to do for the majority of applications. So very, very simple in nature, a lot easier than working with arrays. Now I did want to talk a little bit about this less than and greater than sign or these carrots, whatever you want to call them. This is something you're going to run across a lot when you get into some more advanced C++ development. And even not that advanced stuff. Vectors aren't that crazy, but they're starting to come up already. The reason that vector has these carrots is because it's part of what's known as the standard template library, which is basically a collection of classes that give us functionality for C++ development. One of the functionalities it does is templatized data structures. What do I mean by templatized? Well, this is an example of a templatized data structure because we can pass in what data type we're going to be working with. So we'll get into that more in the upcoming videos, but for now, all you should know is that when you have a data type that has the less than and greater than symbols, you will be passing in a type here and the data structure vector in this case is designed to work with various types. So we're using an integer here, but you could use a string, you could use a custom type, We'll get into that in the next video. If you're coming from another language, you might know this concept as a generic. So a generic class in C Sharp, for example, is the same thing as a templatized class in C++. So anytime we're talking about templates, you can equate those to generics, if you know the term generics. Now, if generics is also a brand new term, then maybe we're just getting into the dirt here and we don't need to worry about all this. All you really need to know is that you create a vector by passing in the type inside of these carrots. Here's how you add stuff, here's how you get stuff, and here's how you get the size. One last thing before you go is that when you're working with vectors and you have some function, let's say this is a function, and this function takes a vector as an input into one of the parameters, well, it's actually going to copy that whole vector into that new variable. That might be something you want, but that's not always what you want. So we need to talk a little bit about passing by reference and we're gonna be getting into that too.